Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we are so happy to see you. If you're here and you can uh, show your face, we'd love to see your face just for a minute, even if to just say hello. Um, welcome to uh, Port, Gen Port Jewish Center's um, Adult Education Program um, this evening, uh, Wednesday, January 11, 2023. It's hard to believe we're in a new year already. I am thrilled and excited to welcome uh, Nomi Stolzenberg and David Myers, who are the authors of American Shtetl, The Making of Kiryas. Um, <laughs> I said it in the Israeli way, but really I need to say it in the like Hasidish way or the yeshivish way, whatever it is. Um, the Making of Kiryas Yoel or Joel, um, a Hasidic village in upstate New York. Uh, so a little bit about our authors. Uh, David Myers is a distinguished professor of history and holds the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Chair in Jewish History at UCLA, where he serves as the director of the UCLA Luskin Center for, the, for History and uh, Policy. He also directs the UC, UCLA Initiative to Study Hate. He's the author of editor of more than 15 books in the field of Jewish history, um, including this one, the American Shtetl. And our author, uh, uh, our second author, Nomi Stolzenberg, um, holds the Nathan Lilly Chappelle Chair at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law. She's a legal scholar whose research spans a range of interdisciplinary interests, including law and religion, law and liberalism, law and feminism, law and psychoanalysis, and law and literature. And after getting her JD at Harvard Law School in 1987 and clerking for the Chief Judge of the Third Circuit of the Court of Appeals, she joined the faculty at USC uh, Law School. Uh, of the USC Gould School in 1988. And there she helped establish the USA Center for Law History and Culture, one of the preeminent centers for the study of law and the humanities. So I could go on and on and on. It probably would make their parents very proud. But, um, but I think I've said enough to give you um, a sense that we are extremely, extremely lucky to have our speakers with us tonight. And I know many of you are really excited about this particular topic. So without any further ado, I don't think I was as brief as you wanted me to be, David, um, but I hope it's okay. You may be a professor, but I'm a rabbi and we tend to go on. So I'll turn things over to the two of you. Welcome, David Myers and Nomi Stolzenberg. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, fortunately, professors don't go on for too long, as we know. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, we're really delighted to be uh, with you. Um, I'm going to start. Um, my name is David Myers, and I'm a modern Jewish historian. And this is Nomi Stolzenberg, uh, who is a legal scholar. Um, and that's relevant um, to sort of begin our story, because the book project, the book that emerged out of a more than 15 year research project, really married our research interests as legal scholar and Jewish historian. Um, and I should note, parenthetically, that we also happen to be married. Um, we're not just co-authors, but we're life partners and the parents of three extraordinary daughters. Um, what we'd like to do is give you um, a brief sense of what th this book is about. It's called American Shtetl. Um, I'm going to begin by sharing my screen to give you some uh, visual markers along our journey. Um, and let us begin at the beginning. Um, so the community we're talking about is a Haredi community, which is um, the Hebrew term that means, for all intents and purposes, ultra-Orthodox, of which Hasidic Jews, um, we can talk after in the Q&A about what the differences between Hasidic and other kinds of Haredi Jews are. Um, we're talking about a Hasidic group. It's also part of a larger circle known as Haredim. Um, and obviously, um, many of you um, know about the existence of Haredi Jews, uh, traditional or ultra-Orthodox Jews in the New York area. And if you didn't before uh, September 9th, 2022, you would certainly come to encounter them better because the New York Times began what is now, I think, a four-part series on Hasidic Jews, um, state support, and education. Um, and we'll be happy to talk about uh, that subject um, uh, uh, later. Uh, what I want to convey with this is the ongoing salience of this issue. Um, I'm not sure I need to convey that to this audience, but um, it's really striking to audiences around the country how the existence of this relatively small group of people in the New York metropolitan area 
is such a lightning rod for public attention. Um, our interest is what animated um, the uh, work that went into this book called American Shtetl, uh, The Making of Curious Joel and a Hasidic Village in Upstate New York. And I should just uh, you know, forestall any questions that will come up. We can talk about it. What is the definition of upstate is a matter that is much debated by people. Uh, Kirsch Joel is not upstate from the perspective of Syracuse, from the perspective of someone in Brooklyn, it is. Um, I'm being somewhat uh, flip about it. We can talk more about this. Um, but um, we want to really call attention to not just the conjoining of our two interests, Nomi's and mine, but the tension in hearing in this title, which is to say a shtetl in America, in the United States, right? The site of the melting pot and the integration of Jews into, at this point, virtually every uh, sector of public life. So what gives here an American shtetl? Well, I want to just make a, a terminological and historical point about shtetl. So shtetl is the Yiddish word that means a small town. Uh, it has the diminutive L, shtot, town, et shtetl, um, meaning a small town or village. Uh, in point of fact, shtetlach, as they took rise in Eastern Europe, these uh, small towns, villages, neighborhoods, um, were usually part of much larger um, urban or even um, in some cases rural uh, uh, towns or villages, um, which is to say, in very few instances, do we have completely segregated shtetls existing at a remove from the larger community. Um, that uh, ideal or idea of the sort of wholly insular segregated shtetl is really um, more a matter of the mythic ideal that we perhaps know from uh, such literary references as Fiddler on the Roof or the work of Shalom Aleichem uh, more generally. Um, so we can juxtapose the actual historical shtetl that was part of very often a thriving, uh, heterogeneous, multicultural, multi-faith, uh, sometimes multilingual ambiance, and sort of the mythic ideal of the shtetl uh, that we know of from literary and artistic representations as a kind of closed, secular, segregated, uh, insular world uh, marked by homogeneity. This is an important point. Because what we're about to talk about, Kiris Yol, Kiris Joel, Kiris Yol, KJ, all these will be terms we'll use, um, really hues closer to the mythic ideal of a shtetl than it does to the historical shtetl found in Eastern Europe, which was the site of the largest concentration of Jews in the world up to the Second World War, some 10 million of the world's uh, 11 million of the world's Jewish population uh, lived in Eastern Europe. So what is Curious Joel? Um, and you see the question on this slide, a shtetl in America, and part of what we'll argue is only in America, in the, in the way that it took rise. It's precisely in America that that more mythic ideal of the shtetl could take rise than in Europe. So what are we talking about? We're talking about not just a collection of Jews who choose to live in a neighborhood. We're talking about a legally recognized village of today, 33,000 Jews, all of whom, with a handful of exceptions, belong to a single Hasidic group known as the Satmar Hasidic group, which is one of and perhaps the largest Hasidic group in the world. These Jews live in a very distinctive, homogene homogeneous, self-contained enclave. Um, very deliberately at a remove from the seductions and allures of uh, a teeming, throbbing urban setting, in which it should be noted, there is another large concentration of Satmar Hasidic Jews, namely in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Williamsburg, which is uh, uh, two and a half times larger than Kiris Joel. Um, so not only do we have an entity that uh, adheres to that mythic ideal more than the historical model of shtetl, but remarkably, something that we did not see in Europe at all, this community is uh, a form of local sovereignty. It possesses a large degree of 
self-governed by virtue of the fact that it, it was initially in 1977 recognized as a village part of the town of Monroe and then in 2019 in a sense seceded from the town of Monroe to create the town of Palm Tree whose borders are completely contiguous with those of Kirish Joel, which is to say they are one and the same. Okay. Now, where does this impulse come from? I want to explain a bit about that and then uh, hand over to Nomi to talk about what's so American about this phenomenon. <laughs> the village of Joel, Kirish Joel, is named after this figure, the founder, the charismatic leader of Satmar Hasidic group. Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, known as Rabbi Yoelish, uh, who was uh, the scion of one of the most notable Hasidic families and one of the most interesting sites of uh, Hasidic life uh, as it takes rise um, in the 19th century. Hasidism emerges in the last third of the 18th century um, and spreads throughout Eastern and East Central Europe. And one of the most interesting laboratories for the development of Hasidic and Haredi life is a region in the northeast quadrant of the Austro-Hungarian Empire known as the Hungarian Unterland. This was the Hungarian part of the Hungarian Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this was one part of Hungary that was the site of, um, kind of clashing vectors, we might say. Vectors of enlightenment coming from the West, vectors of a kind of neo-traditionalism coming from the East that met and created a, a kind of explosive array of different religious and cultural ideologies, one of which was a particular form of Hungarian Haredi uh, or Hasidic um, life, marked by um, unrelenting opposition to all forms of modern innovation. Um, this meant um, uh, new denominational forms of Judaism, other than strict orthodoxy, were regarded as heretical. Um, and very distinctively for Reb Yoelish, Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, uh, Zionism was seen as perhaps the greatest form uh, of threat. He called it in his book, Viola Moshe, the greatest form of spiritual pollution the world has ever seen. Because, he said, Zionism sought to push the hand of God to commence the process of messianic redemption. Rabbi Joel, Reb Yoelish survived the Nazi onslaught of Hungary that began um, in mid-March 1944. Um, he was rescued in an ironic fashion that I'd be happy to talk about later, made his way first to Switzerland, then ironically enough to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel uh, for about a year, and then um, uh, to New York um, in September, in fact, on Rosh Hashanah 1946. Um, he immediately makes his way uh, to uh, Williamsburg, where he begins to build up uh, a community from the tattered tattered fragments of uh, the Hungarian survivor community. Um, and almost immediately as he begins to build up what are called in uh, the Satmar world moistus, um, institutions, schools, shuls, mikvahs, et cetera, he intuits that it is going to be important to create in addition to that center in Williamsburg, a satellite community outside of the city. Why? because it would be easier to avoid all the seductions of the city. And of course, housing would be much cheaper. Um, so he engages in a 30 year effort uh, to uh, 25 year effort to find land where his community can create this satellite community. It turns out many people in the suburban metropolitan New York area weren't that willing to sell land to Hasidic Jews. Um, in fact, they were prevented on um, many occasions um, uh, from achieving their aspiration of creating what they imagined initially not as a legally recognized municipality, but as uh, what they called a shtetl, by which they meant a neighborhood at or removed from the rest of the population where Satmar Jews could congregate and live their form of life. Finally, in 1972, after learning some tricks of the trade, uh, Satmar Hasidim, representing Reb Yoelish, purchased property in Orange County, New York, in the town of Monroe, uh, then spent two years somewhat surreptitiously building up um, a, a community of uh, 25 homes and 80 garden apartments. And then in the summer of 1974, 
the first Satmar Hasidic Jews began to make their way from Williamsburg to uh, to Kyrgyz, to to this uh, community that was part of the town of Monroe. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that the aggregation, the concentration of private property, which is what occurred um, after the first uh, Satmar Jews moved to this community, um, made for a very easy path to transform itself overnight into a Hasidic public square. What do I mean by that? Um, yes, we have uh, we have reversed the titles at the words, the two nouns, at the, the two descriptors at the top of your slide, from private to public, we meant to say. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, so the first Satmars moved to uh, the town of Monroe to this uh, somewhat detached neighborhood. Um, almost immediately, tensions begin to arise over zoning, over what constitutes a single family home over whether there can be a bakery or a preschool or a mikvah in the basement of a garden apartment. These zoning battles lead to threats of litigation on both sides from officials of the town of Monroe on one hand and from uh, Satmar Hasidim on the other hand. And just as a grand clash was to occur in October, 1976, in a religious discrimination lawsuit brought by uh, the Hasidic residents of Monroe against the town and residents of the town in federal district court, a deal was hatched to allow this group of Satmar Hasidic Jews to carve themselves out as a village within the town of Monroe with the rights to uh, regulate their own zoning. And we see, therefore, how this private, this collection of private property owners became relatively quickly um, a a uh, municipality, uh, a, a, a public sphere, we might call it. If you look at the, the paragraph on the right, you see it's actually very easy, according to the laws of the state of New York, to create uh, a village. Um, it's not a particularly heavy, heavy lift. And this is indeed what occurred in 1977, after that uh, uh, near clash in federal district court, uh, the village of Kiris Joel was created. And we can say that. Um, uh, from the time of its creation in 1977, it has been an extraordinary success by many measures, by many criteria, especially those valued within the community. Well, what do I mean by that? In demographic terms, it has grown at uh, an extraordinarily rapid rate, as you can see uh, in the census numbers from 2000 to, to 2020. Um, it, it has achieved a high degree of homogeneity. Um, more than 99% of the community is uh, Satmar. Um, there are a small handful of people who live in the community as, uh, as ch uh, children, uh, child caretakers or uh, uh, laborers uh, who live in the community for short periods of time. Um, so uh, the measure that Reb Yolish valued so, creating this completely homogeneous shtetl, quite a uh, odds with that more historically informed shtetl uh, in Eastern Europe was achieved. Um, not only do we have demographic homogeneity, we have a huge degree of cultural homogeneity. Um, more than 96% of the community declared that they speak a language at home other than English. And we can assume um, if we take a walk on a stroll down the street in Kiris Yol that that language is Yiddish, which is the cradle to grave language of, uh, of this community. Um, the educational norms of the community are, um, are uh, to a great extent, upheld through and promoted through an extensive network of private religious school skaters and yeshivas, um, where the overwhelming majority of the children in the school uh, uh, study. Um, the diet, the educational diet there, curriculum, especially for boys, uh, as we know from the New York Times, if not from other places, is very much weighted to traditional Jewish studies with a very uh, small and decreasing uh, dose of secular studies as one uh, gets older. Um, the uh, overall cultural norm, uh, norms of the community are, are very much in place, um, especially beginning with matters of great importance, community like modesty, as we see in this uh, uh, sign that greets visitors to uh, Curious Joel, imploring them to adhere to the modesty norms of the community. 
By all these standards, Curious Joel is a great success according to the criteria of those within the community and those who see themselves as the true heirs of, of Reb Yoelish. Um, it also has become um, a, a local municipality with very considerable political power, which was not envisaged originally, but became necessary according to many within the community in order to uh, preserve that degree of communal and cultural integrity. Um, and yet to say that all was well within the shtetl would be um, uh, a bit of an overstatement. Uh, first of all, Reb Yoelish uh, was not immortal. He died in 1979. Um, the charismatic founding leader of the Satmar uh, dynasty dies with no heirs, no male heirs. He had three daughters, all of whom predeceased him, um, which spells um, very considerable uncertainty um, and division. Um, there wasn't um, uh, sort of a, a, an anointed heir apparent. The person who became the most logical successor was his nephew, Reb Moshe Teitelbaum, um, who it turns out uh, had a very hostile relationship with the Rebetzin, Rabbi Joel's wife, widow, known as Alta Feige, um, who became uh, the focal point around which those who regarded themselves as true adherents of Reb Yorlish concentrated themselves in opposition to the new Rebbe, Rabbi Moshe. Um, so already at the point of transition, we see considerable tension emerging with the community that would compound over time. Uh, the legitimacy of Reb Yorlish was never accepted by all elements within uh, Kiris Joel. Um, and um, there was particular antagonism on the part of those who came to be known as dissidents toward his eldest son, Rabbi Aaron Teitelbaum, who became the town rabbi of Kiris Joel in 1984. 15 years later, in a stunning move, Rabbi Moshe Teitelbaum decided not to hand over the uh, entire empire to his eldest son, as had long been expected, but to divide it into two. To divide Kiris Joel and Williamsburg into two. And to divide power between his eldest son and his third son, Rabbi Zalman Leib. A completely unexpected development, and yet one which furthered the sense of turmoil within this community that to the outside eye seems to be um, a, a kind of sea of uniformity. Um, these internal divisions are, uh, 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 are joined by many tensions uh, that the community faces with the outside world, especially its immediate neighbors in, um, uh, in Orange County, um, chiefly over competition for vital natural resources of which the two most important are land and water. Um, uh, there are many other tensions that have emerged between Kyrgyz Joel and neighbors, both proximate and distant. Um, and Nomi's gonna talk about some of them, but I do wanna just conclude by saying, we can see Kyrgyz Joel as a completely foreign element that sort of landed um, by accident, like a piece of kryptonite on the soil of the United States. But in fact, when we think back at the history of the American Republic, we can see that there are many forms of religious subcommunity from John Winthrop's ideal um, uh, before the American Republic was created to establish a city on the hill through to perhaps the most successful form of religious communitarianism that we know of in the United States, namely the state of Utah, uh, up to Kirish Joel. All of this makes clear that Kirish Joel in many respects is not an alien entity sort of uh, 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 placed on the soil of America, but part of a much longer American tradition. And now I'm gonna have things over to Nomi. So I'm going to pick up where David left off um, and really sort of try to uh, dive deep into this proposition that Curious Joel is actually a quintessentially American phenomenon. Um, and as David has already suggested, as and a thought that I'm sure is in many of your minds, um, there's something deeply counterintuitive, if not just mistaken, about that proposition. Many people, um, critics of the Sotmers and of the village of Curious Joel um, have accused it of being downright un-American, um, of um, uh, existing and operating in a way that is uh, deeply at odds with 
the fundamental values for which America stands. And indeed, the Sotmers themselves, while always um, uh, rejecting that proposition and uh, uh, insisting uh, that they are law abiding um, and abiding with the fundamental principles of the Constitution, nonetheless, they themselves um, uh, in many ways define themselves as un-American. This is a community that is deeply committed to resisting assimilation to the outside culture, to mainstream American culture. Nonetheless, <laughs> our proposition is that this is a singularly American phenomenon. Um, to put it in the terms with which David began, David talked about the difference between uh, the mythic shtetl um, and the shtetl of reality. Um, the mythic shtetl is in, Amer in many ways an American myth of the shtetl, um, not for nothing <laughs> that Fiddler on the Roof uh, was produced and became a big hit here. Um, and uh, indeed the tradition of religious communitarianism that David uh, just um, invoked um, uh, bespeaks uh, the primacy of religion in American life and the long tradition, the multitude of, of enclave communities, religiously homogeneous communities. Um, but that's just one way, perhaps the most obvious way in which the village of Curious Joel actually fits with American traditions. Um, what actually is American about Curious Joel? Um, the answer to that question is complex. And it's complex for two reasons, more than two really, but I'll just highlight two. One is there are many different aspects uh, to America. Um, so we might be speaking as I just did and as David did earlier about the primacy of religion in American life, the long tradition of religious communitarianism, um, uh, of, of subgroups uh, separating themselves out um, and establishing their own relatively autonomous enclaves. Um, but then again, we might be talking about other aspects of American cultural and political life. We might be talking about democracy. And one of the fascinating and very American uh, or Americanized aspects of the Sotmers of Curious Joel is how quickly um, and how well they have mastered um, the 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 particular form of democratic politics that uh, has been prevalent throughout the 20th century and up until today, um, what's oftentimes referred to as the game of interest group politics. We might be talking uh, not just about the primacy of religion, but the primacy of law in American society. That's something that's oftentimes invoked as something very distinctive, something that distinguishes American society, how much we turn to law um, uh, as, as the place to not just resolve disputes, but to define ourselves. Um, we might be talking about uh, uh, the liberal activist state <laughs> that uh, arose in the 20th century and the ways in which uh, uh, the Sotmers of Curious Joel uh, have been the beneficiaries of the liberal activist state, certainly the beneficiaries of the welfare state, um, and, and the ways in which they participate and in many ways have been enabled by the rise of that form of Americanism. Or we might be talking about liberalism more broadly. And by that, I'm referring specifically to a political creed devoted to the principles of equality and civil rights, and more specifically, the belief that the way to achieve equality and civil rights uh, is through integration. But that, of course, is precisely what seems to be so at odds with Curious Joel. And that brings me to the second reason why the answer to the question of what's American about Curious Joel is complex. It's not just that there are many different facets of America or Americanism, if you will there are actually deep-seated disagreements 
among Americans about what's American, about what the principles for which America stands, what the principles embodied in the Constitution are. So for every one of these features of American society, there, there correspond other features of American of the American political system, legal system, economic system that seem to be in deep tension. So yes, we can speak about the primacy of religion in American life, the long tradition of protection of the principle of religious liberty, but this is also a, a, a political system dedicated to disestablishment um, of religion. Um, yet at the same time, there has long been alongside the belief that America stands for the separation of church and state and disestablishment, everybody's favorite longest word, a long tradition of anti-disestablishmentarianism. And proponents of each of these positions claim to be, as it were, the real America. So too, as against the interest group model of democratic politics, there are those who say that's a very inadequate conception of democratic politics. We need a more robust conception of the common good, of the common wheel uh, that transcends interest group competition. Or on the other hand, there are those who repudiate any conception of the common good or common wheel, um, if not democracy itself, um, who, uh, uh, who, who say that it is an American tradition to enable uh, groups that are different to separate themselves from one another, to have their own local governments, uh, a tradition of enclavism. All of these are competing visions of, the, of what is American. Um, so in the face of this disagreement, these deep-seated disputes, uh, it's, it's not an easy matter to say why uh, uh, the community is American. Instead, what I think we see in the story we try to tell in the book is the way in which Curious Joel and the immense amount of litigation <laughs> that the uh, existence of, of this community spawned, which itself may be a very American phenomenon, became a screen onto which these competing visions of what Americanism is were projected. And I wanna focus on two of uh, these disputes in particular, and the way in which the fight between these competing visions of America um, enabled the rise and the success of Curious Joel to take place. One is that in the very period of time in which Curious Joel is being formed in the 1970s, we are witnessing a retreat from the liberal ideal of integration, a repudiation of integration. And that goes hand in hand with what David referenced before, namely, um, uh, and again, <laughs> we invite you to reverse the terms here from private to public, um, an insistence upon another very American uh, uh, political and legal principle. That is to say the distinction, the existence of a distinction between the private realm and the public realm and the primacy of the private realm. So David talked earlier about how the Sotmers the story of the way in which the village became incorporated is a story that illustrates a, the private pathway to legal incorporation. It's a private pathway to the establishment of a village of, by, and for the Satmar people. I want to say a little bit more about the ways in which the American commitment tradition of commitment to the primacy of the private realm enabled the community to take rise. This is a somewhat crazy slide, but imagine if you will, if I had the technical abilities to have animated, I would imagine if almost everything on the slide 
is in the first instance absent except for the township of Monroe at the top um, and the, the Monroe Woodbury School District. That's the school district whose existence preceded uh, the, uh, not only the establishment of the village of Curious Joel, but the arrival of the Sotmers to the town of Monroe, um, which is adjacent to the town of Woodbury. Um, and so you had extant two very important and very typically American local government entities, the town of Monroe, the public school district, a regional school district that encompassed both the town of Monroe and the neighboring town of Woodbury. Um, how does the, the Sotmer village of Curious Joel take rise? Initially, if you look on the uh, left-hand side, with a development company, right? Private enterprise, a private property, a real estate development company, um, which acquires the tract of property, subdivides the tract of property, um, creating in the first instance residential units. That's everything here at the bottom. Everywhere you see an O, that's the de development company sells property to owners. Those are the O's. Renters rent from the owners, and we see a proliferation of private property. So too, the development company is responsible for acquiring the land on which this large and important institution, the synagogue is built. What is the synagogue? From the standpoint of American law, it's a private corporation, a nonprofit corporation incorporated under New York state laws that govern nonprofit religious corporations. Um, so too, the yeshiva, the boys school, the girls school, these are private entities, privately owned entities, um, uh, incorporated, um, operating um, under the state regulations that apply to the operation of private nonprofit institutions, in particular religious congregations and private schools. Um, the cemetery. <laughs> many of many of the private entities are uh, uh, subsidiaries of the congregation, um, and then you have private uh, committees uh, like. Uh, the Modesty Committee. In an earlier slide, David showed the now infamous sign that welcomes, uh, if you consider it, some people find it a very unwelcoming sign, uh, uh, strangers to the town, um, admonishing them to observe the community's modesty norms, which are by and large um, norms of uh, gender uh, uh, segregation and um, uh, uh, modesty, uh, those are enforced by the Modesty Committee. That's a, at least from the standpoint of American law, a private, a private organization. So too, what's known as the Vad Hakiria, the the town committee. <laughs> um, well, what is the Vad Hakiria? For all intents and purposes, it is indistinguishable from the development company. Um, it's the private, or at least nominally, legally private uh, uh, land use planning committee. But who runs the Vod Hakiria and the development co committee, uh, the company? Well, as David related before, it's only after private property is acquired, subdivided, sold, rented, inhabitants come, then they are in the position to, using the instrumentalities of local government law, local democracy, exercising the franchise, they vote to create this subdivision of the town. Now we're moving above the line to the public entities, the village, right? The village includes a village board of trustees, basically the, 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 the city council, the village council. It has an elected mayor and a deputy mayor. Eventually, for reasons we can talk about in Q&A, it establishes its own school district, separating itself from the Monroe Woodbury School District. Um, 
who holds these public offices? Well, in many cases, the public office holders, for example, the longstanding mayor of Curious Joel, he originally occupies the position of deputy mayor, um, uh, Abe Weider, um, for now decades, he's been the mayor. He also uh, alternates between being now below the line, the president of the board of the congregation or the vice president. The, the village creates a, a building department um, to enforce its building code. Who runs the building department? The same person who runs the development company and the Vad Hakiriya. There's also a public housing authority that allocates public housing units. Again, overlap of personnel. So from one point of view, you have this very important distinction recognized indeed insisted upon in American law and politics between public and private entities. And indeed all of the work of maintaining the homogeneity of the community some would call that the work of excluding non sotmers and all of the work of maintaining conformity and adherence to religious law as interpreted by the Satmar re uh, Rebbe's is performed pretty much exclusively by the private institutions and private actors. It's not the village itself. There's no zoning law that says you have to be a Satmar to live in the community. There's no law passed by the village that requires adherence to religious law or religious norms. So what is the significance of that? And what is so American about that? Well, one profound question, uh, uh, legal question, uh, as well as political and moral question, is whether the private character of all of these private institutions and private actors that I just references, does that serve to insulate the community from the accusations that are leveled by critics against the community? What are those accusations? It's accused of being exclusionary, of excluding non sotmers of being uh, internally coercive, of um, uh, 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 using coercive powers to maintain, to enforce religious law inside of the community. And it's accused of violating the principle of separation of church and state. These are the accusations that support the perception of critics that contrary to our thesis, this community is profoundly un-American, operating in a way that's at odds with uh, American principles. But what are those American principles? Now I'll return to my earlier point that there is no consensus about what the fundamental principles of Americanism are, or even where there is agreement about how to interpret them. So I want to close by leaving you with a, a, a sense that I think will be familiar to pretty much all of us who have lived through this, um, of the existence of, and I'm painting in very broad strokes, broadly speaking, three different points of view, schools of thought, visions, competing visions of how to interpret the fundamental principles embodied in the constitution for which America stands. Each of which offers a different answer to the question of whether this legal distinction, this formal distinction between the community's private institutions and its public institutions serves to insulate it, to defend it, and in essence provides an alibi against the charge that it is, as some have charged, a theocracy um, uh, operating in, in violation of the principle of separation of church and state ostensibly embodied in uh, the first, the establishment clause of the First Amendment. I say ostensibly because against the sort of mainstream liberal view, what once upon a time people used to talk about as the consensus view, the American consensus, that a principle of separation of church and state is embodied in the establishment clause of the First Amendment, 
even though it is nowhere explicitly stated in those terms in the Constitution. Precisely over the period of time in which Carius Joel arose, the, a conservative movement made up both of a kind of pro-business economic libertarian wing, but also of what we now know as the religious right. The religious right has relentlessly attacked the proposition that the establishment clause embodies a principle of separation of church and state. At the same time, the conservative movement uh, has attacked another mainstay of the once upon a time consensus view of liberalism that America stands for principles of equality and civil rights that are best achieved through integration. Both of those principles of integration and separation of church and state have been under sustained attack by the religious right and the broader uh, conservative movement of which it's a part. But it is not only from the right that the liberal vision of integrationism and church state or religious state separation uh, has been attacked. In this same time period, I'm again speaking about the 70s and 80s, the years in which Curious Joel takes form, we also see a repudiation of both the principles of integration and to a lesser degree, but to a significant degree, this idea of a strict separation between church and state coming from the left, right? Certainly the principle of integration, um, if you think about the black power movement, black separatism, lesbian separatism, more liberal forms of multiculturalism, communitarianism, identity politics. This is a point of view that is to say the least ambivalent about integration and the separation of church and state. So uh, here, just a reminder uh, of how that uh, repudiation of liberal integrationism, this idea that we should transcend differences of race, creed, and color, um, that repudiation by the Black power movement with this uh, expression of racial pride was quickly echoed by other forms of, e of ethnic pride um, in what's been called the Roots to movement. Um, and as we see liberalism itself begin to retreat or at least become ambivalent about integration on the one hand and strict separation between church and state, we begin to understand the framework and the forces that have led to a dramatic reinterpretation of the First Amendment principle of separation between church and state um, and equal protection principles with regard to whether or not integration is required by the principle of equality, all of which created a political framework and a legal framework that was increasingly facilitative and supportive of the separatist enclavist aspirations of a, the, a religious community such as the Sotmers. Um, and it is that backdrop that is um, much of what we have in mind when we talk about the Americanness of Curious Joel. We're now happy to take on any questions you might have. Thank you so much. I was brought back to law school <laughs> and uh, my like the basics even of just my constitutional law class. Um, and uh, I am, I'm gonna open it to questions and I'm just gonna uh, shift how my screen is laid out so that I could see everybody. And I'm also going to, it should, it, in, it goes it. without saying that there's much that was excluded in this uh, <laughs> brief talk. Um, yes. the, the, the book begins with a description of daily life in Curious Joel. It then moves on to talk about the origins of Samar Hasidism and how the group made its way to the United States, and then uh, moves on to talk about the Americanness of the community in ways that Nomi just described. So we're happy to go into any part of that or other questions you have. Marsha and Mark, do you want to start first? 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, hi, uh, and thanks for that. That was fascinating. Um, I, I, I kind of like to go to the last topic you covered because, you know, it's, it is sort of confounding. I mean, in America, we have had a history of things like housing covenants and um, exclusion of different minorities and separate religions. And, you know, um, I, I think that technically, like, for example, if a group of white supremacists set up a place and would not want to allow any black people in, I assume that would be problematic for a lot of people. But I, I guess I'm asking is, you know, where do the legalities on this go? And what do you think is right? I mean, technically, I should be able to go buy a house in Curious Joel if I wanted to. But I suspect that would be impossible. Even though legally, I should probably have that right. So, I mean, how do you how do you square all that? It's a really good question. And they're actually really, so if you're just asking like, what is the law? <laughs> um, it's It's not so clear because, and this really goes to the point I made earlier about um, uh, uh, the way in which uh, the commitment to uh, a distinction between the public and the private realm operates, right? So uh, you refer to fair housing acts, right? Um, and you say, well, don't we have laws <laughs> that prohibit um, uh, refusals to sell or rent property to people on the basis of their religion or their race or their gender? Yes, we do. Um, since the 1960s with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, um, you know, one of the signal achievements of the civil rights movement. Um, and indeed, several decades before, it was the Supreme Court that declared, that you were, I think, alluding to, that racially restrictive covenants, what's a racially restrictive covenant? Um, it's an agreement, you know, if, if two or more private property owners enter into an agreement and each promises not only that they will never sell or rent their property to a black person or a Jewish person or what have you, um, uh, but they pledge that anyone, all successive owners will be bound by the same agreement. That kind of covenant was commonplace, not just in the South, across America. And in 1948, the Supreme Court declared such racially restrictive covenants to be unconstitutional, to be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. However, as strong pronouncements as those appear to be, not only was the legal theory underlying that decision um, extremely controversial, um, it, it had a lot of, let's call them loopholes in it. Why was it controversial? Because the Equal Protection Clause only applies to state action, right? To act, governments are obliged to not deny anyone equal protection of the law. Neither the Equal Protection Clause nor the First Amendment applies to private actors. In order to apply the Equal Protection Clause to these private agreements between private property owners, the Supreme Court had to adopt a very, some would say, critics would say, strained interpretation of what counts as state action. And it has never been fully accepted. When I refer to the conservative movement, since that decision, one of the main points on the agenda of the conservative movement has, get, has been to get the courts and other political actors to reject the idea that constitutional obligations that apply to state actors also apply to private actors. That's, that libertarian belief that private property owners should be free from government regulation actually constitutes a clear and present danger to the ongoing <laughs> existence of fair housing laws. It's not out of the question that they could be deemed to be unconstitutional for that reason. And even as they exist today, it's partly an issue of it's practically speaking impossible to enforce 
a prohibition against a single individual property owner or renter. And it's not even clear that by their own terms, they are meant to. They apply to large scale property owners, real estate management companies, but a single renter or, or a single property owner, they are legally speaking, practically speaking, pretty much free to decide to whom they want to sell for whatever reason they want. I'm going to take a stab at that question, Mark, um, uh, from the perspective of um, a non-legal specialist um, by saying, beginning by saying, you know, we, we came to this book with the intention neither to condemn nor to condone. Uh, it was really important that we be perceived as fair actors um, uh, by all parties. And there are a lot of parties within Curious Joel, a tremendous amount of diversity within Curious Joel. Um, so it was really important to um, sort of maintain that stance. And in that regard, you know, we really tried to understand KJ as part of this tradition of religious communitarianism that took rise on American soil. And I think had the general impulse that this was part of an American sensibility of live and let live. Um, if you have a group that seeks to preserve its distinct culture, right? And does so, you know, without offending anyone or causing uh, bodily or other harm, then they have the right to do that. Um, and I think we both felt a measure of sympathy with that form of religious communitarianism, differing doses of sympathy between us, I would say, but a measure of sympathy. I think both of us kind of had a interesting revelation in general after January 6th, 2021. Um, when we saw, I think in clear um, view, how fractured the vision of common um, and how disruptive and dangerous it was to any meaningful sense of the common wheel for each group to be allowed to do whatever it wanted without any regard to the common wheel. And I think we had an interesting kind of wake up uh, to understanding the limitations of that unrestrained let's call it what it is, religious libertarianism, right? I'm going to go do what I want to do. That's the American way, albeit in a religious idiom. And we knew that that religious libertarianism, as we understood it, was taking rise just as there was a very powerful movement to assert that the paramount liberty in the United States, according to our constitution, was religious liberty. And so I think we have a somewhat different perspective on the perspective uh, on, on the community. Um, still, I, I should say, from my perspective as a student of modern Jewish history, I'm fascinated, and this is what I'm beginning to answer Rhonda's question. This is what sort of drew me to this uh, as a research topic. Fascinated by um, the incredible success of a group of Jews to assert a strong sense of community in the modern age in the face of all sorts of powerful countervailing forces. In Europe, it was totalitarian fascism that sought to altogether undo that capacity for a collective Jewish existence. In the United States, we might say it's at the opposite end of the spectrum. It's liberal integrationism, what Nomi spoke about, right? That sort of gravitates against that, uh, that sense of, uh, of communitarianism, that strong sense of community. Um, but we understand that, you know, along with rights come responsibilities. Um, and I think we've seen, you know, um, different perspectives um, emerge in the wake of January 6th that sort of somewhat add a new lens to, uh, to the ones that we had been using before. Um, I do see, I, I do want to, I know Ellen had a question. I do want to clarify um, what was on the slide. According to Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum, the Holocaust was caused by Jews. That is to say, Jews committed to the project of returning to the homeland in Eretz Israel were engaged in what is called dechikata ketz, hastening the messianic end through decidedly human means. 
that Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum believed was the gravest of transgressions. That was, that is a matter entirely of divine will. It's entirely a matter of divine prerogative to commence the messianic process. And when Jews did so, they incurred the wrath of God. It's a one of the most challenging, troubling, and in many people's view, reprehensible dimensions of uh, his theological worldview. Um, it made him perhaps the most prominent Jewish anti-Zionist of the 20th century um, and someone who elicited um, uh, great en enmity and, and hostility uh, in no small part because of that view. I have to say there's so much here <laughs> and so much to hold, you know, all at once. I'm trying to like, um, I'm trying to um, like my reaction to places like Kiryat Yoel or Kiryas, Kiry, sorry, Kiryas Joel um, is just, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of people, especially anyone who has any family in that area is they've done so much damage, you know, in a lot of different communities in Rothen County and in, um, is it Putnam County where they are? Orange um, County. What, Orange what? County. what? Orange. Orange, Orange County. Um, Orange County to the, to the public education system um, and have really destroyed property values for people who, um, who aren't part of the Sotmar community, you know, who don't live there, but I mean, who don't live in their community, but live in the town. And now, you know, all of the money has been drained out of their public education system and they're kind of left with not a lot. So I have a few, I think I'm expressing what probably a lot of other people are thinking about. We also read, you know, not only the most recent articles in the New York Times, but, you know, this is covered in our local papers all the time mm -hmm. because it affects so many of us. I know my colleagues who are rabbis in those communities um, are also, you know, dealing with, um, you know, dealing with uh, the consequences, frankly, of, of places like Kyrgyz Yoel. So if you could just um, mm -hmm. comment on yeah. that. So, you know, you put your finger on two of the, you know, I talk about accusations. Uh, they bring down property values. Um, they destroy the public school system. So, you know, whether or not they bring down property values, that may depend, but, and, and one understands, right? That our, 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 you know, the property next to us is for sale. I'm worried something's going to happen there that's going to bring down our property value. That's an under, but I am wary, you know, let's remember that's the same thing. You know, what, what was the main in instrument of white flight? Oh, blacks are going to bring down property values. And that might, that, that was sort of true, right? <laughs> it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do people have a right to exclude people of a certain kind because of what, Mm, well, that flies in the face of the principles embodied in the Fair Housing Act that were really designed to stem that logic that says, no, you don't have the right to live with your own kind. And by the way, note that that points out that people who want to resist the incursion of Hasidim or Haredi Jews, they're expressing the desire to live with their own kind every bit as much as the Satmars are. Okay, public schools. The first thing I wanna point out is that the story of the public school district in Curious Joel is precisely the opposite of the story of what happened to the public school district in East Ramapo. In East Ramapo, Haredi and Hasidic Jews, who first of all, there were many different varieties. It wasn't just one group of Satmars, um, nor did the Hasidic Jews or the Haredi community more broadly uh, incorporate their own separate municipality. They remained part of the municipality of East Ramapo. That's to say they remained part of a very diverse population. So they were, they, so unlike Curious Joel, which technically was part of the Monroe Woodbury Public School District, and it was not until it first formed its own separate municipality, and then 10 years later formed its own public school district, but what did it do? It's exactly the opposite. 
instead of quote unquote, taking over a public school district, they established their own separate school district. So not drawing resources away from anybody else. There's a lot one could say about both of those models, pro and con. And it's difficult to say because really the main driver of resources being, you might say diverted, or some would say being channeled is special education, which is an immensely complicated and expensive endeavor. And until we understand the mechanics of special education, I think we should all hesitate to draw any uh, firm judgments about what's going on in either case. But what I will say is notice that if you juxtapose critics of the public school system inside Curious Joel, that's a public school that only the only students in that in the Curious Joel public school are students with special needs. And the only reason they sought to establish their own public school district was to provide special educational services for students with special needs. The <laughs> Hasidic Jews get criticized either way. They get criticized if they remain in a public school district and seek to have special education resources delivered to their children in their religious schools. They get criticized for taking over. Whereas in Curious Joel, they get criticized for not taking over, for separating themselves and withdrawing. Now, I'm not saying that justifies what happened in either case, but I think we should be self-reflective about what we're criticizing and why. Just one small um, addendum to what Nomi said, apropos property values. Kirish Joel is the fourth most expensive place to live in the state of New York. The first is a community called Kaser, which is a community of Vishnas or Hasidim that is part of the town of Ramapo. The third most expensive is New Square, which is also a Hasidic uh, village part of the town of Ramapo. So three of the four top slots of the most expensive places to live in the state of New York are uh, Hasidic villages, um, which is uh, you know uh, a point that makes clear how desirable that property is for those seeking the religious lifestyle that uh, these communities offer. I want to be sensitive to time. So let's just say we're going to go for another five minutes and then we'll, you know, I want to, um, so, uh, so, so my eye is on the clock, um, uh, but Bill, I'm going to turn to you for a question, Bill Keller. Unmute yourself, Bill. Thank you, Rabbi. You, you actually, I'd put in a, uh, something in the chat too. Um, if it is that expensive to live, my understanding is a lot of Hasidic uh, communities here and in Israel survive, for lack of a better term, on um, the public uh, troth uh, with food stamps and um, uh, whatever the uh, uh, system is. I know that's part of the... Um, I have um, friends in Israel and there's a lot of tension between the Haredi and, and the um, uh, you know secular Jews, but how does it support itself from an economic standpoint? Yeah. So I'd say there are three principal components to that uh, question uh, or to my response. One is, indeed, uh, the community does receive a large amount of uh, state and federal support. Um, uh, it, it's important to note that in the 2010 census, about 60 percent of the community um, was uh, identified as living below the poverty line. That a uh, number has gone down in the 2020 census to about 45%. So there's a, a significant shift underway, a growing uh, middle-class um, uh, community emerging within Curious Joel. But there is tremendous public support. And poverty means that if you're um, earning $60,000, uh, but have a family of 10 or 15, you will be deemed below the poverty line. Right. So it doesn't mean you're living on $24,000 a year. Um, as we're talking about community, a community with very large family size, uh, a very large number of children, um, and um, the federal government, um, as well as the state, provides support 
um, uh, for um, uh, families of such size, according to um, a sort of a, a, a widely known and publicized uh, register scale. So that is one way in which the community uh, is able to survive. There's also an extensive internal philanthropic or charitable network uh, that provides assistance to those in need. Um, and it's quite remarkable to see in, in operation. Um, if your neighbor, if you're a sort of wanna belong to that rising middle class and your neighbor needs money to uh, support, uh, to throw a wedding for a child, you unquestionably give. Um, it's an enormously charitable community within that self-contained system. Um, that's number two. Number three is the community works. Um, this is not a community in which men are enjoined to learn Torah all day. Reb Yoelish was very explicit. Men should learn Torah in the morning and the evening, and they should work uh, in between and earn a living. Um, where do they do that? How do they do that? Um, and, about, women. and women. And increasing numbers of women, I should add. Um, we see very significant rising rates of women uh, working outside of the house as well. Uh, so there's been a very significant uh, rise, um, I think about a 30% rise in uh, the percentage of women working in the community that reflects a kind of incipient, we might call it incipient feminism. Um, although very few people, very, very few people would ever embrace that term within the community. One or two whom I met did, but very few. Um, where do people work? About a quarter work in the city. And um, that means Brooklyn or, uh, or Manhattan. Um, a very substantial number go to a major summer business uh, in Manhattan, b &H Photo, um, to work. Um, uh, a quarter or so work in various forms of small business in and around Curious Joel. Um, and the largest employer in the community is the private school system, um, which teaches, uh, if we add up the kids at all of the three main educational institutions, there are three main streams reflecting three ideological camps within Curious Joel, that belonging to Reb Aaron, the chief rabbi of Curious Joel, that belonging to Reb Zalman Leib, the chief rabbi of Williamsburg, and that original group of dissidents who are known as the Benai or Benai Yol, the sons of Joel, each have their own educational institutions. Thousands of students in them, requires a lot of teachers. Um, and the public school, the, the private school system is a huge employer uh, within, uh, within the community. So it's a community that works um, and also supports, is supported by substantial amount of both uh, private charitable and public uh, funding. Thank you. So I just want to thank you. Um, it's um, <laughs> so much to think about. If you were hoping that all of us were going to buy your book when you were done, you did a really good job um, because um, you've you've left us with more questions than answers, and that's a good thing. Um, and I appreciate your answer to my question, um, especially because, I mean, you're thinking about it purely from a legal perspective, and I suppose it will be also very interesting to see what, how, you know, generally speaking, the court as it is, you know, at the Supreme Court as it is um, populated right now, um, how their future decisions will affect um, places like Curious, Yoel, and um, uh, and other communities. So with that being said, um, you know, there's just, there's so much more to learn. And uh, I wanna just remind people, I wish I had like a neat way of wrapping this up, but honestly, I've, I'm feeling very shaken. I'm just being honest. Um, I do really struggle with this. I think it is helpful to remember that there is a distinction between maybe like um, places like Ramapo High School, Suffern um, and Curious but Curious Yoel, but you know, there is the reality of that, that this is, um, this is a high pressure religion. Um, not everybody and it is, is, you know, thriving. Um, it works for some people, it isn't working for other people. The education system is, you know, one which can be wonderful and, and not wonderful. You know, we talked earlier and didn't have a chance to answer this question. Um, but there are issues in terms of, you know, family structure and what happens when you get divorced. And if you want to leave and all of those things, there are, so many more questions and we don't have enough time. Um, we are so lucky to have had the opportunity to listen to such brilliant people. Rabbi, how do we get them back? 
So I know we, we all we, have I've our questions. I've got my my father came from Eastern uh, Eastern Poland. So I just want to say that the, I the have first, so many questions. So the first way you can do that is by getting the book, Marvin, and reading it. Um, <laughs> so much there. No, I'm serious though. No, uh, I, I got so it. Much there. There, are lot, um, there are a lot of answers in the book, and we, yes. we did we did put our emails in the chat. So please don't hesitate to email. Um, please note that at the end of my email, don't add a period after email. I'm going to actually, so friends, but I'm just, so I'm just going to say, so thank you for just letting me like have that moment of therapy. And, um, and what I'm just going to say to you is, is this was recorded. I'm going to send it out um, uh, with a link for, um, to buy the book with a discount from Princeton University Press. If you, once you read the book, if you want to read it, leave a review on Goodreads or even on Amazon, that's always helpful to our authors. Um, find, they are professors and, you know, some of the finest institutions in our country, but it never hurts to leave a good review. Um, and, uh, and more people should learn about what they're teaching. So um, that being said, the, the name of the book is American Shtetl. I say it's Shtetl, you say Shtetl. Um, <laughs> Uh, tomato, tomato, but American Shtetl, the making of Curiosity, Joel, Joel, a Hasidic village in upstate New York. I just want to say um, our next program is February 1st um, with one of my teachers, uh, Rabbi Shirley Eidelson. She's author of We Shall Build a New Stephen S. Wise, the Jewish Institute of Religion and the Reinvention of American Liberal Judaism. She was one of the deans at Hebrew Union College when I was a student there. And she's quite brilliant. And uh, we're lucky to have back to back such fantastic, um, such fantastic teachers. So um, professors Stolzenberg and Myers, thank you beyond measure um, for your thank time. You, and uh, everyone have a great night.